Thomas J. Scott, Director of Special Publishing for the Naval Institute and a fleet professor with the Naval War College for more than 20 years. Mr. Cutler, a renowned naval historian and author, is a retired service warfare lieutenant commander and former gunner's mate in second class who served in patrol craft, cruisers, destroyers, and the aircraft carriers USS Saratoga and USS Independence. His active duty assignments included an in-country Vietnam tour, small craft command, and nine years at the U.S. Naval Academy. Cutler, Thank you, sir. Although I'm not an aviator myself, uh, I don't feel out of place moderating this panel because I've had the privilege, and I mean that sincerely, the privilege to serve with many aviators during my years in the Navy. One of them, coincidentally, is uh, on this panel and was the best skipper I ever served under. Um, to say that I'm in awe of naval aviators would be a huge understatement. And the reason for that awe is that in its first 100 years, Naval aviation has accomplished many incredible feats, as we've learned much about today, uh, which have played no small part in this nation's proud history. In that first century, naval aviation has also seen many revolutions and much evolution. Now, as we stand at the brink of the uh, second century, the obvious question is, where do we go from here? Fortunately, we have four of the world's experts here today to tackle that question. And in the interest of time, I'll keep their introductions brief. Their biographies are all available on the USNI website. Vice Admiral Robert F. Dunn, United States Navy retired, former Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Air Warfare, and President of the Naval Historical Foundation. Vice Admiral David Archisel is the United States Navy, now serving as Commander, Naval Air Systems Command. Vice Admiral John P. Courier, United States Coast Guard, uh, Deputy Commandant of Mission Support, and Dr. Norman Friedman, analyst and friend of the U.S. Navy and author of the Naval Institute's Unmanned Combat Air Systems um, book, a book uh, as well as many other books to which to mention. I'll ask these gentlemen in the order I just introduced them to present their views briefly on what the new century will hold for naval aviation, and we'll begin with that well done. Thank you, Tom. And uh, in response to Tom's uh, kudo to me, I will offer him a kudo. He was his best officer of the deck I had. <laughs> <laughs> That's, is that okay? <laughs> now, uh, those of you who are here are probably all members of the Naval Institute. Or if you are not, you should be. <laughs> and at any rate, you've got a copy of the latest proceedings when you checked in. If you will read the lead article in that magazine, you will see everything I propose to say this afternoon. So I'm not going to elaborate very much on that, but instead just cover a few, uh, a few small items. Uh, you've heard about the uh, history of naval aviation from at least World War I. Uh, when we're through, you'll hear about the transition to jets and the war in Vietnam. Uh, you heard about the Cold War from Secretary Lehman. What I've been asked to do is to prognosticate, to look into the future of naval aviation. It could have been any one of you up here trying to forecast the future of naval aviation who would have done at least as good a job as I'm going to do. Because we all engage in dreaming about and hoping about and maybe even doing something about the future in our lives and in naval aviation, and that's most important. But uh, as I begin, even though I know you've read my article uh, and studied it uh, carefully, <laughs> I want to read the first part about it. I, I try to answer uh, what will the next half century bring? And the present is a good place to start. Uh, but there, I must caution you about that. And here's the story I want to tell you. Uh, in fact, I don't have to read it because I can tell it. It was uh, a long time ago, in 1954. I was on a cruise in the USS Wasp. 
Uh, USS Wasp was a straight deck ship and it had an open forecastle. Those of you who know carriers today know they have streamlined uh, front ends. This is open, an open front end. It had gun tubs because there were anti-airplane tubs. It was gun tubs. A group of the air wing pilots were gathered on the forecastle one evening. After flying, we didn't fly much at night in those days, and uh, for those who cared to, having a smoke, it was a good place for that. And in the course of the full session, one of the Cougar pilots, those were the frontline fighters we had, the F9F6 Cougar. Uh, one of the more senior ones opined that his airplane was probably the last fixed wing airplane the Navy would ever fly. Because after all, there were missiles and drones coming along. And to prove it, we had a detachment of an outfit called Guided Missile Group 2, whose job on that ship was to follow along a Regulus missile when a Regulus was fired from a submarine and guide that Regulus to its target. Made sense to us. The guided missiles were going to replace us. But of course, we didn't know at that time that the, the Patuxent River and other places in the Bureau of Aeronautics, which that place used to be called, were uh, airplanes that were actually flying, like the uh, F-7U Cutlass. Well, it was almost flying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and other new, new aircraft. So the story, the story is, is told merely to uh, tell you to be careful about how you forecast the future. Remember popular mechanics from years ago, how they were going to be flying cars. I've seen lots of drawings. I have not yet seen a flying car. On the other hand, uh, Maxwell Smart had a telephone in his heel. We probably all have telephones, not in our heels, but in our vest pocket or our purse, whatever we happen to be carrying. So some things do come true after a while. So having finished with the preliminaries, let me, uh, let me start with something else, which I think uh, is necessary as a reminder. First, a reminder, and you would think this audience would need this reminding, but I want to say it anyhow. Some 70% of the earth is covered by water. Most of that water is international space. The air above it is international airspace. And it's capable of supporting all kinds of operations, whether they be combat operations, offensive, defensive, humanitarian, the list goes on. Now with the relative quiet of the hemisphere in which we reside, the Western Hemisphere, our potential adversaries are all in the other hemisphere, particularly in South Asia and East Asia. And those bodies of water, that Pacific Ocean, is nice when you look at it as protection, but just like we can traverse that ocean, others can traverse that ocean. So we have to have the capability of defending our interests somewhere away from our shores rather than waiting for any potential enemy to come to us. Now, in traversing that, traversing that ocean, the time is very important. In my early days, I made cruises to the Western Pacific, and it would take us two weeks to get from, say, Alameda to Yokosuka. That's intolerable unless you're paying for a cruise these days. I mean, everybody will get into a, an airplane, a 747, and get there in a matter of hours. Well, the same thing if you want to maintain a presence against a potential enemy. You want to be there now. You don't want to wait and have to traverse a large ocean, which might take a number of hours. And in order to be ready to meet that potential enemy, you need aviation of some sort. And the best way to put that aviation there where it can be used is aboard a floating platform, a platform called an aircraft carrier. And fortunately, the Navy has a number of aircraft carriers. So with that certainty in mind, uh, let's go ahead and try to peer into the future some 50 years from now, the year 2061. Now, those of you who are dressed in civilian clothes here probably aren't too worried about 2061. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you midshipmen should be concerned about 2061 because you'll still be around. My Naval Academy class just celebrated its 60th anniversary. So you see, if somebody had told me 10 years out of school to look ahead to 50 years, I'd have told them to go peddle their papers. Pay attention. <laughs> First of all, my forecast is, and I say these things in hopes that in the discussion period we'll come back, uh, large deck aircraft carrier battle groups, a 
along with land-based naval aviation and rotary wing aircraft, will still be with us. Uh, nothing on the horizon indicates that forward deployment based on aviation is going to supplant those systems. In fact, you and your children and maybe your grandchildren will sail in ships and aircraft much like that. Still, the naysayers don't surrender. They continue to pop up like dandelions in the grass in the spring. Uh, Captain Tal Manville is here. He can attest to that. <laughs> Periodically, somebody will say, why do we need that expensive weapon system? And then we pull, we pull out the studies. We pull out the thousands of studies. We write rebuttal articles, and the aircraft here goes on doing its good thing. The UAV, as we heard this morning, that will, will continue to emerge as aerial platforms, albeit not as quickly as everyone might think. There's a thing called Fire Scout, which is here now, flying off destroyers. The X-47B isn't that far off. The first squadron is expected to embark on a carrier in 2018, but the first F-35 squadron was due about now. So you see how things tend to slip. Uh, with the uh, UAVs, the early missions will probably be reconnaissance and surveillance and airborne early warning with electronic warfare not far behind. Maybe later on ground attack and even cargo bowling is in the cards. But I'm going to leave that to Emma Larchazel and to uh, Norman Freeman to discuss that. Kind of thing. Uh, the operation of carrier borne UAVs uh, will lead to better accepted automated carrier landing systems for manned aircraft. Now, let me say, that we've had automated carrier landing systems since the early 1960s. And the systems, by and large, are very good, and they work very well. But they're not used. Why aren't they used? General Bolden touched on that this morning. There's no thrill like catching the three wire by yourself. <laughs> so there's a psychological thing that has to be overcome. But someday, someday, uh, we might even be able to have automatic carrier landing systems sophisticated enough that the pilots will trust them, they get credit for them, and uh, one day uh, in the not too distant future, the mark of a good carrier pilot will be something other than the number of traps she has. Hard as that is to believe. Uh, sometime during the next 50 years, naval architects could well come up with a system for carrier stabilization. Uh, thus uh, minimizing the pitching and rolling that you get in heavy seas, like the one that described by Admiral Pruer and uh, Dr. Robo earlier today, uh, Rubel earlier today. Uh, the Gerald Ford's electrical system might just have enough capacity to run such a system. Electronics will continue to develop into shapes and capabilities unheard of today. One certainty with electronics, however, the young people of 2061 will understand them. The older folks like you and me and the members of the class of 2012, 13, and 14 won't understand those electronics because that's the way life goes. Let me give you a little story. About two years ago, I got a chance to go over to Crystal City there in Arlington, Virginia and fly the F-35 simulator. It was open cockpit and we had an experienced uh, instructor of the right and I sat in the cockpit and I was mystified by all the controls despite all my time in the air. But he talked me through things, and I was able to make a carrier arrested landing. I was able to make a, a vertical landing as though it were an F-35B. And I, I continued to look at this thing with a throttle with about 12 buttons on it, and a side stick controller with another 12 buttons, and there's about four, with five, I don't know how many, 100 uh, <laughs> flat screen displays with a heads up display. And I said to this instructor, how in the world does anyone ever check out in this airplane? And he said, it's hard for you. But when we get these midshipmen over here, they take to it like that. Mm -hmm. So things will change. Electronics will change. Youth will accommodate, and they'll uh, they'll learn. They will adapt. Uh, electronics reliability will continue to improve by 2061. Today's self-test, a lot of self-test out there, may well develop into self-repair. That's in the laboratories today. Likewise, other electronics improvements could well lead to development of internal sensors to measure the service life of aircraft. So instead of having to take an aircraft that has a certain number of calendar hours on it and say we've got to pull out the barrel section and inspect it, you might be able to tell that from sensors that are built into the airplane. 
Uh, aircraft will indeed see longer service lives. That's being forced upon us. And even in 2061, uh, we're liable to see F-A-18, E's, F's, G's, and P-8's in the fleet. Uh, perhaps a little bit controversial, but much is made of the use of alternative fuel for our aircraft. I personally think it's an idealistic concept. Uh, and uh, therefore, fossil fuels will still be with us in 2061. Once crop lands are used for fuel take the place of crop lands used for food, there's going to be more than revolution in lots of many parts of the world. Energy-based systems, uh, weapons, small enough to be carried in tactical aircraft will become the norm. The logistics of resupplying bombs at sea will become as anachronistic as mail coming in from an oiler once a month. That's the way it used to be. Finally, uh, tail hook will still be going strong in 2061, <laughs> and so will the Naval Institute. And the midshipmen of that day will understand will not understand <laughs> the music of the midshipmen of 2011. I'll <laughs> but naval aviation in all its dimensions will continue to be an integral part of the Navy, setting the standard for combat effectiveness for all to see. I felt like I go back to my youth. This is sorry, I'm going to admit in a second, but I go back to my youth and I think about watching a TV show as the Texas Rangers. I don't know if you ever saw that, but they come down the street, they're in a kind of V, and one by one they peel off and end up with only one man standing at the end. So I'm watching the group today and I'm thinking we're getting smaller and smaller. So I appreciate all the people that come on here today. I was struck by the uh, briefs this morning because uh, for the midshipmen that are here, let me tell you right up front you have a place in naval aviation, you have a place in a cockpit. Uh, you have a place out of the cockpit, but you have a definite place in the naval aviation in the future. Don't, don't be taking what you heard this morning. Let me, uh, but if I'm not done convincing that of, when I get finished now, I'm going to stay until I do convince you that because it's very important. But what you heard today was about, from some of the, especially the middle panel, was about setting expectations for yourself and what you have to do and challenging yourself. That's what aviation is all about. Aviation is about leadership. Aviation is about seeking goals and achieving them. When you, when you think back about 1908, we talked about the beginning of naval aviation, Glenn Kurtz was a motorcycle guy. He built engines. He didn't, he didn't know about aviation. He went over to France where this thing was an aviation. He won the, land, the aviation speed record in, in 1908 and he flew 46 miles an hour. Two years before that, he'd been on the beach of the Vero Beach and gone 140 miles an hour on a motorcycle. He, it, wasn't, it was just what was going on. He was challenged by innovation. He wanted to have that experience bring it forward. And so when you think of that, that's what I think about aviation you come into. this energy in it. It sounds, there's so much to go forward with. It's not something that's coming to this end of people. It's just the beginning. And you all are the future, and you should realize that. Um, when you get into the idea of what went on in that time, in 1908, we went over that speed race in Rhine, France. He won that race. And what did the French say? French said, well, there's no interest in that. I think you can go 46 miles an hour, I have an application. We're not going to go into aviation, thank you very much. What did the Brits and the Germans do? They went and built dreadnoughts. There's no interest in aviation. What did the United States of America do? We went into aviation in a big way. And it started with an assistant secretary of the Navy back before that, back before the turn of the century when he was assistant secretary of the Navy. The name was Theodore Roosevelt. If you go on this finest ship in the Navy today, the Theodore Roosevelt, by the way, don't ever call that ship Teddy. His name is Theodore Roosevelt. Mr. Secretary, I want to correct that to the record. It's Theodore Roosevelt, and it is a fine warship. But then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, before the turn of the century, wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy and said, I've seen the Langley Flyer and the work of the Wright Brothers, and this aviation has great application for future naval warfare. It was that person who could think and be out there and insightful, that realize you don't, should be threatened by innovation, shouldn't be threatened by new ideas, but how you can apply them. Don't think of unmanned aviation as a challenge to aviation. It is aviation. It is what we need to do. You need to bring that in. You need to think, what are the norms that exist today in aviation? What are the norms we need for unmanned aviation? They're not the same. But how would you build them together? How would you use that? When we talk about automatic landing systems today, 
Yes, we have automatic blended systems today, but automatic blended systems bring you along to a point when you get to a closed approach to a point on the carrier deck. That is not the same as what we're doing with precision guided GPS and tactical data links that control your waypoint to waypoint and can navigate you unmanned in a case one environment. That's not the recovery phase. That's you come in and get in the carrier zone and then it takes control and you bring it down and land it on a ship. That is a whole different dynamic than we're talking about automatic carrier landing system. So those are the kinds of things you should think about when you go forward. So I'm a little worked up, I apologize, but <laughs> there is a lot to do here. <clears throat> There's some other things I feel like on new trains, so I have to correct some things. Yes, there was the demise of CV-58, right? That was going to be the US as the United States, and it didn't go forward, and we did not build that ship. But on that keel, we built the 1759, which was the forestall. So all things presented one way, we did go forward. There was another USS United States we were going to build, right? That was CBN 75. Today it's not called the United States, it's called Harry S. Truman, but we still have that carrier. So names are nice, but in the end, what do we have? So I think the carrier force will afford something else to be aware of. When you look at what I see the future naval aviation, I'm, again, I see a lot of great capability, a time of dynamic change for aviation, never before seen in the history of aviation. We have every single type model series, not one, not two, not three. Every single one is either in transition to new systems and platforms or will be soon. And I'd be happy to go over those with you one by one. And if we get questions, maybe I'll do that. But I'll just give you some examples. Let's take the Maritime Patrol Reconnaissance. P3, long time airplane, we're going to P8, we're going to the ZAMs. I'm man and man. Married together for a capability we would never have and a persistence capability we would never have if we didn't marry up those systems, man and unmanned. Strike fighter. We're going from the legacy Hornets, A to D, which today are running the centroid of those numbers somewhere around 6,500 hours. We're going to take them out to a maximum of 10, but probably more like 8,600 hours. We're going to have E and S, as you know, already in place, the Super Hornets. The growlers, they're coming in behind the growlers. And right behind that is this thing called KSF, a remarkable capability that brings with it the next generation of what we need to have in tactical aviation. Same thing comes true on the rotary wing. And if you look at when we have the Bravos and the Foxtrots, today we're having Romeos and Sierras and numbers fielded. Um, the H46 to the B22. H A1 Yankee the Whiskies and Novembers to the Yankee Zulus that are out there for the Marine Corps today. By the way, someone raised a question today from the midshipman and said, is there a working between services? When you're in aviation, you don't think about services between Marine and Marine Corps. We are a team. We have always been a team. We will always be a team. There's only one Naval Air Systems Command, and it serves both services. We don't have a Marine Corps system for aviation. It is Naval Air System. So just get that in mind when we talk about that. Pick any other type model series and you'll hear the same discussion. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond we won't be naval aviation if we don't have ships. We need to have those carriers of tomorrow. We need to have those systems that Tal and others designed and gave us that we can go forward with. We need to have things like electromagnetic aircraft launching system that gets us off steam systems. That we're good to a point, but we'll not get to the 90th percentile aircraft and high weight energy recoveries and launches. You need to get to a different system because we want to be able to use those, those aircraft platforms of the future. So advanced to resting gear, the all three level of the carriers that can support the electrical distribution needs of the future carrier. The networking environment we talked about today, industry is going about $40 billion a year into 4G networking and capabilities. Trust me, the Department of Defense is going about $1 billion a year. We've got to get off our own development. We've got to get on to commercial technology and use it. Those are real facts as you go forward. And you'll all see that when you get into it. I look forward to your questions because the biggest challenge I face is this transition piece. It's how we continue to bring on a very difficult capacity and capability when we also have to keep our legacy until that capability is there. And one of the one things we do struggle with is we have an appetite for capability. And we want to have the best there is and the best there always will be. And there's a point where capability, if you just did a very simple X and Y diagram, you have a capability 
that you can deliver across the x-axis, but there's a cost factor on the y-axis. And for a while it's linear. You can deliver a certain increase in cost, you can get a little more increase in capability. When you reach a point where there's a knee in the curve, and then you're going to get a much, for a very small increase in capability, you're going to pay a substantial cost increase. And you also pay a time penalty, and you also have a risk penalty. So when you deal with today, when you deal with some of these systems in there, I'll tell you one of the biggest things is balancing concurrency in terms of capacity, capability, complexity, and also making sure we made our warfighter needs first and foremost above everything else. I look forward to your questions, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Currier. I'm a United States Coast Guard officer. This is not an Air Force uniform. <laughs> uh, I'm here. I'm, uh, my job is Chief of Staff of the Coast Guard, or also Deputy Commandant for Mission Support as we transition to our new organization. I guess I'm here uh, to look at the future of naval aviation, but the future of naval aviation, in my mind, is, is larger in context than strike. Uh, I'm also here as a rotary wing aviator. And I would remind everyone that 65% of the people wearing these wings in the United States Naval Services are rotary wing pilots. So uh, it is a big part of it. I'm also here, obviously, to represent the Coast Guard. And I appreciate the passion because what I lack in intellect, I also make up for in passion. I would say that uh, I would look at the threats to our, to our nation slightly different because we're a maritime safety and security service or the cops on the sea. I look at the state actor threat axis that was described earlier, certainly the Asian axis of threat. But I also, our job is to look more inside in the littorals. And I, I probably differ a little in perspective on, on the threat and the impact of threat to the homeland. All right? If we were to allow a threat inside, I guarantee you the effect on the psyche of this nation would be just as profound as an attack on US interests overseas. Our job is to protect the littorals. We can't do it. We've got a bench strength about an inch, inch deep. What we do do effectively is to partner with the United States Navy and other agencies, whether they be local, state, or federal, to bring that law enforcement presence forward. In our analysis, many of the non-state actor threats that this country faces will start out in a security and a law enforcement type scenario that could easily develop into a threat to the nation. So that's our role. I was three in PAC area, which is our uh, mini version of PAC fleet, and we worked very closely with the third fleet and the Pacific fleet to develop protocols on how we would work together seamlessly in a supporting, supported relationship to, uh, to, to take these threats as they vary between national defense, security threats, or law enforcement type threats that could, could expand. What's the role? The perspective I have as an aviator is of the ship helo team and the value of that. Uh, not in the context necessarily of carriers, but certainly they are a front piece for, for national security. But the powerful nature of the small ship, helicopter, MPA, UAV team and maritime domain awareness, threat detection, threat identification and interdiction can't be undersold. And I think here again I talk about rotary wing and its value. And we've taken the helicopter, and we've been involved with the United States Navy and the Magnificent Naval Air Systems Command since day one. I have a friend who lives in Maine who's 94 years old, who was helicopter pilot number two for the Coast Guard, was the first CO, the Rotary Wing Test Director at PAX Group, was the first helicopter pilot in the United States to make ship helo landings during World War II. So we are married to the Navy. It's a matter of perspective on our contribution and our size. Obviously, we're much smaller. But we are in there in the partnership and, and truly appreciate it. To look to the future, I'm going to take a little more tactical perspective than I've seen before. I talked about the ship helo team and its value. We realize that every single day in the Eastern Pacific and the Caribbean, when we stop drug boats with armed helicopters, with 50 caliber sniper rifles, and we're stopping these things, this, this can translate into the kind of criminal threat, terrorist threat, interdiction that the inside waters, the littoral waters in the United States need. So I think we're developing it. In, in our rotary wing perspective, though, we really need speed. The V-22 cracks a threshold, brings us forward with rotary wing capability. But it's a hybrid aircraft. 
we really need to see small helicopters that can be carried on, on board ship that can reach the 200, 225, 250 knot threshold. And I think that's probably there in the future. Some of our manufacturers and overseas interests are, uh, are looking at that technology and how we can advance rotary wing aviation from a speed perspe perspective. Excuse me. I see unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, as does uh, Bicep Launch now. I think uh, we're going there. The value to our mission line is maritime domain awareness. We need persistence presence because you can't interdict, you can't target what you can't see, what you can't detect. So I think that's really a, uh, uh, a growth opportunity in the future. Specifically in the near term, we very much need broad area maritime surveillance radars on board unmanned area vehicles. We also see, need to see our MPA developed. Our MPA is a C-130J, and it has a very, very sophisticated detection uh, capability. We need to marry that with unmanned, with our cutter or small ship kilo package, such that we can surveil, detect, interdict, target in, in, the, uh, in the littoral waters, independent of the battle group. The other thing, and I won't go on much longer, but the other thing I see as essential to Navy, naval aviation in the next hundred years are people. We need to emphasize STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. If you see it in the basic educational profile in the United States today, it's, it's absent or declining. The United States Naval Academy, the Coast Guard Academy, the other service academies certainly bring forth a population of young officers who are equipped for equipped for the challenges in engineering, aeronautical engineering of the future. But in general, our, our uh, educational system is not producing that. I share that concern, I'm sure, with the Navy, with the DOD services, and certainly with industry. If you talk to CEOs in industry, they universally talk about this as, as, a, as an issue in the future. What we need to do is develop young people of today with the character and the ability, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, not only to become effective naval aviators, but to become the leaders of the future. I always like to say to my folks, I'm a senior aviator in the Coast Guard, and I talk to our own people all the time, we are facing challenges. The current budget environment is pretty austere, and we've got to get through this. This is a threat to our national security, make no mistake. But I really, truly take the glass half full view of this and say, we've got challenges. We've overcome challenges in the past. The future is bright and the sky is the limit. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and I see that I can solve all the world's challenges in about three minutes. Uh, I was asked to talk about the future of carriers. The first thing is, I would echo Admiral Gunn. There's a reason that carriers exist. It isn't because People like walking on large flat decks, or they look nice when they're painted gray, or something like that. And a lot of people think that's the case, right? There is no other way to put serious, sustainable striking power near anybody else's shore. If you were allowed to use nuclear weapons, you might claim you could do it with a submarine with tomahawks or something like that. But nuclear weapons don't seem to be that much in the cards. Something that almost no one will ever say is that once nuclear weapons are out of business, you can forget about quick, decisive strikes on anything. Things are going to be sustained, or they're not going to happen. Sustained means you have to be there. There's no way out of this. Well, what happens when we get squashed badly in budget? I mean, you have to be insane to think that we're going to have a good time with the budget, right? So the question is, how do you preserve this capability? Is there anything coming that's going to make it possible to stay in business? What I've never heard in the UAV discussions is, if the thing costs less to operate at some point, less altogether, it's going to happen. It's going to happen even though it may not be as good as what came before it. That's the nature of being broke, which is usually the case. Basically, if you, if you have uh, UAVs that are flown individually by pilots, you save almost no money adopting it. 
you save almost no money because you require all of that training flying just to stay in business. And in fact, as the Air Force has shown, you lose a lot more of these things in crashes because the pilots they use don't work. So that you actually pay more than you would previously. If there is some way to use them, like missiles, if it turns out that a lot of the time, strike missions mean dropping weapons on targets found by some other means, satellites, other UAVs, whatever you like, then it gets a whole lot more interesting. And what you're really looking at is a reusable missile. Now, that sounds interesting, but maybe crazy. What does that got to do with people? Well, at some point in any kind of operation, it's human judgment. If there isn't, then I don't understand what business we're in. The question is where that judgment should be exercised. If it's a strike mission and you're trying to interpret a lot of information, the judgment may very well be outside of whatever flies. If it's a mission in which you're flying and the conditions are very ambiguous, and let's say there's an intruder coming around and you don't know if it's hostile, let's say it's a target which you have to identify because you really aren't sure what it is, there better be somebody in that thing better not bet that you could pre-program it in advance. There have to be some manned platforms for those kinds of jobs. Depending on the circumstances, there may be the majority of platforms. If there's a way to cut the operating cost of carriers, that pays off for the United States. And we have to be very careful that when there's a budget disaster, which there is, we always talk about what's good for the country, not what makes the Navy happy. We know that when we talk about what makes the Navy happy, what we really mean is makes it more effective in the national interest. But it's very easy for people to pervert those words. And we can get into a lot of difficulty that way very rapidly. The other thing is, if we emphasize that going unmanned takes people out of danger, that's the beginning of a slippery slope to being very easy to defeat. We value our lives, but, and I haven't been in combat in any conceivable way, so maybe I'm out of line, but you can't say, make it dangerous for us and we'll run. Okay? I can't emphasize enough how much depends on our ability to get these kinds of messages across. If you think it doesn't really matter because it's so obvious that it, the idiot will pick it up, uh, remember what happened to the British. Uh, last night we heard that a lot of Americans like to uh, look at the Royal Navy of the uh, late 19th century as a wonderful model for today. Well, I'm not sure they should be so happy with that. Because that Royal Navy, which did pretty well, goes into World War I and doesn't come out that happily. That's the Royal Navy that, after they fight the big battle with the Germans, they're not really good at explaining what happens, and the first news of Jutland is from the Germans, making it sound like it's one of the biggest German victories of all time, which, by the way, it wasn't. That set the stage for people not to be all that convinced that the Royal Navy was all that good an idea. And if you look at their more recent, extremely glorious history, losing their carrier force in one shot, you might notice what, where that goes. We have to keep the message across. 70% of the world is water. Most stuff goes by water. If you think like a Navy, the world is really very different than it looks like on a map. Things are a lot closer. I know it takes forever to steam from San Diego but it's infinitely easier to get from San Diego to Yucusca by sea than, for example, to go from our Chicago to New York by road. A lot less energy is involved. No one who looks at a map normally thinks like this. It's our job to get it across. I don't know how well we can do, but we have to try. Once you do that, you start saying, well, events of war really matter. You want to know what, what the enemy is? The enemy is people who think that if it's not right on the United States soil, it can't possibly matter. Let's kill off anything that goes abroad. We've been there before, right? We can go there again. 
uh, the next campaign will include people talking like that. <coughs> Once you realize you have to be abroad, then you start thinking a lot about strike operations. You think strike. You're thinking about how much you can generate. And you're thinking about what you're hitting. As far as whether this is all some futuristic thing that could never possibly happen in real life, we're already operating at an armed UAV. It's called a Tomahawk missile. The only conceptual difference between the Tomahawk and an X-47 is that the X-47 is supposed to come back. There's no joystick, right? Have you heard about somebody piloting a Tomahawk with a joystick? I haven't. You program it, you tell it to go someplace, and it goes there. End of story. With this stuff, if we do it right, you tell them where, where you want them to go, they find their way there, they do it, they come back to a holding area. If we, things work properly, you can refuel them to flight. This is very nice. You want them to have a lot of judgment, you have to be crazy. What Professor Rubel said this morning, that this is about uh, uh, moral capacity, War is going to be about choices. The only question is where the choices are made. You must have a lot of access to information on this forward deployed carrier because that's how the, these things will be targeted. If you look at, at wars like the Libyan business recently, what you see is that it's very unlikely that someone coming in at high speed can realize exactly what the targets are like. That has to be done by somebody with a lot of imagery, intel, things like that. The natural place for that per person is in some kind of uh, command space on board a ship, if he's got enough data. It's probably not in Nevada because he's so far from the action, he doesn't have the slightest idea what's happening. That's for services in which uh, old clubs are more important than action. <laughs> 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 That's the advantage of not being uh, uniform, and hence not subject to go away. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm wondering whether in the interest of the economy, gold and nickels might be disassembled. And the, the Employment Act to save the Air Force pilots might be rescinded. This would have an impact on us, although you're not supposed to think that. Anyway, my guess for the future is that you need large decks because you need concentration of force. Also, if it's bigger, the odds are you can make it a lot harder and you can't sink it as easily. Everyone who always talks about the borders of small carriers eventually discovers that you pay more per airplane, you have to replenish it more often unless you get rid of bombs completely, which I don't think you can. And it carries less fuel, so you have to replenish that. Uh, unless you invent some airplane that doesn't require fuel, don't think you'll see in the near future, or the far future, um, concentration matters. If I had my brothers, there'd be a lot more carriers. The reason for a lot more is there isn't going to be any other way to use air power abroad. It's sort of obvious, to me anyway, that people will increasingly not like giving us airfields in foreign countries because they're not stupid. I remember a briefing after the, the uh, 2003 war in the Gulf about getting access to the airfields in the region. And basically, we could do it, but we had to pay an incredible amount. And it's not just money, it's also other things. If you can't get there, why do we buy land-based airplanes? I mean, yeah, the Air Force is running out of airplanes, but maybe we should all be employed. <laughs> what you want is things that can be deployed when they're needed. That's what the country wants. So I apologize if what I said is so obvious that you won't sleep. And really, my guess is you're going to keep seeing carriers. Uh, now, I must admit to you that I like ships a lot. And I'm kind of disgusted that, that there are so few places now, and they're not really different. And the cruiser out there is much more like what I think is a real ship. But, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be professional, so I'm Thank you. Thank you.
run, run over. We don't have time for questions, but I think we've had some pretty good uh, food for thought here. Um, the obvious thing that we need to take away from this is I see a lot of nodding heads in here, which means we're all pretty much in agreement, which is uh, on most of these issues, which is uh, preaching to the choir. What we really need to do is figure out how to convince the rest of the nation and the Congress that, uh, of these things, and I think that's where the real challenge lies. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you, each member of the panel. Um, it is my pleasure to present you each with a book from the Naval Institute Press, and I hope that it will be good reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.